Our message this morning comes from 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, with focus on the very last verse. And you'll notice I don't have verses by each one of the words because I had to type this in because I didn't have the program while we were at Nathan's helping him. So I was working on my laptop. And I had to copy it out of the Bible itself. Do not team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will line in them and live. walk, live. live with them. See, that's what happens when you can't cut and paste. <laughs> and walk among them. I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out, come out from among unbelievers, and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Do not touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will be your father, and your, your, you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Lord, forgive me for skipping around there. Happy Father's Day. Same to you. Thank you. So I thought I'd try uh, change up just a little bit. I got a couple of slogans that I found that I wanted to share for Father's Day. First of all, D.A.D., Divinely, amazingly designed, Dad. Divinely and amazingly designed. <laughs> Father said to the son, be careful where you walk. The son responded, you be careful. Remember, I follow in your footsteps. The word father equals Father, thank you for always being there for me, teaching me skills, having the biggest heart, expecting nothing but giving everything. You are really, you are the best. And I thought this one was the best one of them all. The past can hurt you, but the way you see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Then under five, a little child in the church for the first time watched as the ushers passed the offering plates. When they neared the pew where he sat, the youngster piped up so that everyone could hear him. Don't pay for me, Daddy. I'm under five. <laughs> and one more. A car issue. A young boy had just got his driving permit. He asked his father, who was a minister, if they could discuss the use of the car. His father took him into his study and said to him, I'll make a deal with you. You bring up your grades, study your Bible a little more, and get your hair cut, and we'll talk about it. After about a month, the boy <coughs> came back again and asked the father if they could discuss the use of the car. They again went to the father's study where his father said, Son, I've been really proud of you. 
You have brought your grades up. You've studied your Bible diligently, but you didn't get a haircut. The young man paused for a little bit. Then he said, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Samson had long hair. Moses had long hair. Noah had long hair. And even Jesus had long hair. To which his father replied, yes, you're right. And they also walked everywhere they went. <laughs> so, you know, we got to have a little humor once in a while. Father's Day in the USA holiday is a holiday, the third Sunday of June, to honor fathers. Credit for their, this holiday is given to Sonora Smart Dodd of Spokane, Washington, whose father, a Civil War veteran, raised her and her five siblings after <coughs> their mother died in the childbirth. <coughs> she is said to have an idea had the idea in 1909 while listening to a sermon on Mother's Day, which at the time was becoming established as a holiday. Local religious leaders supported the idea on June 19, 1910, the month of the birthday of Dodd's father. A hundred years later, President Calvin Coolidge gave support to the observance. And in 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson issued a proclamation that recognized the day. It became a national holiday in 1972 when President Nixon signed legislation designating the third Sunday of June as Father's Day. There's your history for Father's Day. <clears throat> People of the world, I know today is message is something that you may not want to hear. But we must understand what the Heavenly Father is telling us through what Paul has said here in today's reading. If you are planning to seek a man or a woman for your spouse, preferably of the opposite sex, according to the Lord's creation design for mankind, who has told us in many places in Scripture that if we do anything other than selecting a woman or a man at, for a spouse, that it is not the same as you in that realm. It is good to do if, but if it's not, if it's the same sex as you, and it is an abomination. In other words, if you select somebody of the same sex and he's called a man and the other he's called a woman, that's abomination to the Lord. So we're not to do that. But today we're celebrating Father's Day, the male of, of the family, the mess, man of the house. Let's get that straight. The New Testament spells it out as to what happens when we do things that anger the Lord. And we will not be allowed into the heavenly place until we repent and turn away from the wickedness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 <clears throat> Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornication, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, but you, but you were, were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. More on this topic later. 
Father's Day is a day set aside to honor Dad here in the USA and thanking them for the hard work they do to raise a family. Raise their children and teach them the ways of life. First, in our scripture reading, Paul tells us not to re in recommendations, but in not in recommendation, but in serious concern that we, as a rule, should never join ourselves as believers to those who are unbelievers. Why, you may ask? Reason number one. Righteousness can and will not unite with wickedness. Light cannot live in darkness because Jesus is the light of the world and we must walk in the light and let the light show through for others to see. Three, there is no harmony between Jesus Christ and the devil. Four, a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever very seldom lasts for long. Been a proven fact. <clears throat> God's Ten Commandments tell us that there shall be no other gods before us, which means a union between a believer and an unbeliever will not work because the believer has come, become a temple of the Lord and the unbeliever is one who puts his trust in false gods and objects or objects that do not bring light into the world. Paul reminds us the Heavenly Father has set us apart giving us the protection from evil because it was defeated when Jesus was put to death, buried, and rose again. As we read the last part of our reading, we read the following. For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will line, live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Do not touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Just as Jesus walked with the believers on a daily basis, so too does the father of his children. And just because we cannot see him, he, God, the Father, is always with us and among believers continually. Remember, he tells us once we come to believe in him, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hold true to that. Paul then tells us, therefore, come out from among the unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord and do not touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father. He never quits. <clears throat> Just because they're out of the home, they're still our children. We are still their father. 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 14. Now go and say to my servant David, this is what the Lord Heaven's army has declared. I took you from tending the sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. I have been with you where, wherever you have gone and I have destroyed all the, your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make you your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on earth. And I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past, starting from the time I appoint to judges to rule my people Israel 
and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. You see, he's describing what God is describing what he's going to do for David. But see, God does that for all of us who believe. We as fathers, yes, they're out of the house. Or even when they're in the house, we take care of our children. We bring home the bread. There was a time when I brought home the bread, working three jobs and spent very little time with my kids because I wanted them to have the best that I could give them. Not boasting at all, but I'm saying as father, we have a responsibility toward our offspring. We're not only a leader, we are a teacher, a caregiver, and a helper. <clears throat> That's what God has done to David and to us as believers. He's right there with us, walking through all that we walk through. The question is, are we calling on him on a daily basis? And thanking him, most of all, for what he has brought us through. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he sins, I will correct and discipline him with rod, like any father would do. So children in the audience, you know, if you're hearing this, we're not doing it to disgrace you. We're not doing it to hurt you. We're doing it to bring you up in the proper way a father should bring up his offspring. Sometimes that may be painful, but God says we are to discipline. We are not to spare the rod and watch the child be spoiled. So just as God did for King David, so too does the father do for his children. We discipline, we love, we show them as we discipline them that we do love them and we don't want them to make the same mistakes. And sometimes we try to keep them from making the same mistakes we made. Because we knew we got hurt in the process. A father does what it takes to bring his children up as God <coughs> has done for all of us. God has led us to jobs to support the family. It's our turn to show our children how to do that. God corrects us when we are wrong. He corrects us as we should correct our children and discipline them with the rod when necessary. Once a father, always a father, even after you are gone from this place. Some of us are very fortunate to have their fathers still here on earth. However, the memories live on after they depart. We all can remember what dad done for us, good or bad. And I think about all of the times that he took us fishing. And one of the joyous times my dad had for me is when we visited the Hibbing Mine Range in Minnesota. 
from Michigan, one of the two. But he took us up there. We were in Minong, uh, where my grandpa lived, and we did fishing in the lakes up there and caught so many northern, I can't remember how many. But then one weekend, he took us up to the Hibbing Mine Range, and we got to tour that whole iron ore aspect up there. I can still see the mind in my memory today. There was many times he showed us, I worked with him in uh, rebuilding the John Deere B tractor, handing him wrenches and cleaning the parts and stuff like that. So there was a lot of good times. The joy of raising a family was every time one of my boys was born, was being right there. One of them that reminds me the best is the one, the third one, Jason was born. I backed out of the parking lot after leaving the hospital and I scraped the brand new Cadillac with my vehicle. <laughs> so when the cops finally got there, they said, well, you know, and the owner had finally come out there too, and he says, you know, I appreciate what you did. He says, you could have drove away and not said anything. I says, I don't do that. I says, I try to be fair with everybody. So they fill out the paperwork, and I went home with a scrape on my bumper from that car. But I was always there, full of joy, in fact, I was so excited that Jason came that uh, somebody else got an insurance premium because I <laughs> scraped his car going out of the parking lot. In the book of Jeremiah, we read about the people of Israel when God has moved among them and caused them to want what God was, has given them. You see, God watches over his people he protects them and walks with them daily, no matter what they're going through. He wants to be our deliverer. He wants to be, wants what is best for us. All we have to do is repent and follow Him. You know, we're talking about a Heavenly Father who cares about all of creation who does the same thing that he wants us to do to our children. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I know when we have a family gathering and they're there, I'm with, filled with joy. Because they finally come and share and we have a good time. When you decide to, it kind of reminds me of the prodigal son. When God has his arms open wide for us, to make that one step and say, yes, Lord, I believe in you. Please forgive me. And the Lord's arms are wide open, waiting for that moment to bring him in. As the prodigal son's father was when the father's son realized that he'd had a better life than where he was at and come home and says, I don't deserve this. And the father grabbed him and hugged him and kissed him and had to all of this done for him and threw a party for him. God will do the same thing for each one of the lost souls. And that's the story that Jesus is telling in the prodigal son. God is just waiting. The heavenly Father is just waiting for those who are lost to come to him and say, Lord, forgive me. I believe in you. I believe you sent the Son, Jesus Christ. 
I believe that he died on a cross to wash my sins away. That's all we have to do. And I have to repeat this again and again. Sometimes people say, well, I've done, done too much and I have to get all this. No, you don't have to clean up nothing because let me tell you something from experience. I didn't do anything but follow him and he walked with me to take all that away. He persuaded me to say, forgive me. Because we weren't going any further until I asked for that forgiveness. We don't grow unless we know what the <coughs> Father wants from us. For those of you who call on the Father for forgiveness and follow Him. Jeremiah 3, 31, 9 says, Tears of joy will stream down their faces and I will lead them home with great care. They will walk beside quiet streams and on smooth paths where they will be not stumble. For I am Israel's Father. I am each believer's father when they come to confess their sins before him. I think the happiest time I've had in all of my parenting was when my sons wrote a letter to me. And the letter says, thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for what you taught me. And I've gotten that from all four of my first sons. That's what Jesus says when we come to him. Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. final statement here he is and can be your father as he is to those who believe will you turn to him and say thank you Lord for all you will do in my life thank him and for advance for what you're looking forward to do in your life Perhaps you're out there on the street looking for a place to live. Call on him to help you find it. Or maybe you're down on your, what some people call luck. You got no place to go. God will open doors if you just ask him. Say, Lord, I don't know where I... I don't know where to go from here. I'm at the bottom of the t tunnel. The well is empty. I have no place to live. I don't know what to do. Just to call on Jesus. Say, Lord, help me. No, he tells us to call on him and give all our concerns for him because he cares for us. He also says, I will give you rest. But if you don't call on him, he can't do it. He won't do it. You just have, have to call on him with believing that he'll do it for you. I can promise you that he won't deny you. I'm a living example of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you.
for all that you do for all of us. <clears throat> Both believers and unbelievers. To the believers, you help us when we call on you and ask you. And you're always there, right there. For the unbelievers, you're waiting with open arms, waiting for that one moment for them to look up and say, Lord, help me. Lord, I just ask that you would be with all the fathers in this world today, that they would realize that responsibility for those who have turned their backs on it. That they would come to realize how important it is to be that father image in presence to, in front of the children. As you've made it very well aware to all of us believers that you're there always and ready to work with them when they ask. And I thank you for all that you've done for this congregation. Guide us and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.